Thank you so much. Um, you know, it's so exciting for writers to get out of the house. Sometimes I feel like we're dogs being taken for a ride in the car. We get very, very <laughs> excited. Um, but sometimes when I go to an event, uh, something happens and I get asked the worst question you could ever ask a writer. Never ask a writer this question. Someone comes up to you, here's your writer, and they ask, would I have heard of you? <laughs> so, it's so terrible. Um, but I, you know, for a long time I would name my books and their eyes would roll up into their head and they would finally say, I only read vampire fiction. <laughs> but I realize that there's one good answer. When someone says to a writer, would I have heard of you? A writer ought to say, in a more just world. <laughs> so, I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about the possibly sometimes more just world. Uh, that can happen as a fiction writer, um, and talk about my novel, The Female Persuasion, which I think, well, there was a picture of it up there before, and talk about uh, my novel, The Wife, a little bit, even though that's not in the program. I have 45 minutes uh, down at my feet, and I will sort of try to accomplish everything, including a QA. and a I feel sometimes um, when I have to sort of compress things into a short period of time, as if I'm kind of reading one of those abridged versions of classic novels that children read. You know those ones? The ones that go, all happy families are alike. But Anna Karenina's family was different. <laughs> they had some problems. Look out, Anna, here comes a train, the end. Um, so to start in my abridged classic novel, I will talk a little bit about the female persuasion. So have any of you read the book? Oh, wonderful. I'm going to have to ask the rest of you to leave. Um, <laughs> it's really, it's just among us. Uh, so I wanted to write a novel about female power, misogyny, making meaning in the world, but also about the person you might meet in your life who sees something in you when you're young and changes your life forever. Have some of you had someone like that? I suspect a lot, yeah. In fact, actually... Um, my publisher, about six months before the novel came out, had an event where they invited a lot of, of, of young women, mostly women, uh, like media writers, journalists, feminists, and they gave them name tags, and they had to write their name and the name of someone who had influenced them when they were young. And it was amazing. There were so many folk dance teachers, uh, Michelle Obama's, all kinds of women on there, and it was very, very touching to me. Um, the novel is about a young woman named Greer Kadetsky, who is very, very shy, and she doesn't know what to do with her life, and she goes to college, and the first weekend that she's there, she goes to a frat party, and she is groped by a frat brother, and she doesn't really understand what's happened to her. She thinks, is the thing that happened to me an assault? Is it something I should just suck up? Is this what it means to be female? And she doesn't really know what's happened. And it reminded me, when I was writing this, of so many experiences that women and girls have had, not necessarily being groped, but being looked at a certain way, or being spoken to a certain way, and the face going hot, and not having a sense of whether you have a right to feel really upset about it, or how upset you're allowed to feel. And it's a kind of nuanced thing, and I wanted to write about that. And um, the book came out right in the middle of the Me Too moment. And I did a lot of inter interviews for it, and people often asked me, um, well, once or twice they asked me, did you write your book after the Me Too movement began? I would have had to have like hired a lot of people to call themselves Meg, and we would have all gone into a room, and I would say, you, can't, you take chapter one. Because the truth is, these are ideas that I think most of us have been thinking about for a very long time, right? I see a lot of people nodding. And the book is about what happens when that young woman, Greer Kadetsky, she's 18, um, feels so affronted by what's happened to her. She doesn't know what to do with it. And she sees a little piece of paper up at the college where she goes, and she's a freshman, that the famous feminist, Faith Frank, is going to be speaking there in a couple of weeks, and she wants to go see Faith Frank because she wants to ask this woman who was kind of a couple of steps down in fame from Gloria Steinem, what do I do about that feeling? What do we all do about that way it feels to be female in the world? 
and she goes and basically stalks the famous sexy feminist into the bathroom and the ladies' room, ironically. And um, after college, this woman who was, was quite well known in the 70s and her magazine that she ran, which I love making up the names of magazines, rock bands, restaurants, all kinds of things in novels. My son thinks that's why I write novels. Um, <laughs> But I, her feminist magazine is called Bloomer Magazine, named after <laughs> Amelia Bloomer, and that was fun. Faith Frank hires Greer Kadetsky to come work for her and to be her <coughs> protege. And I was thinking a lot about mentors and protégés and my own experience with them in my life. So when I was in first grade, I had a teacher named Mrs. Gerby who would invite me up to her desk to dictate stories to her because she could write them down so much faster, and my handwriting was kind of mural size. Um, the stories were really, really bad. Um, one of them was about two truckers, and the dialogue went, get up on the rig, Mac. Um, I think, I didn't know what a rig was, but I knew that this was the language of adulthood, and I wanted to sort of approximate it. And I think that's what writers do. They approximate things as a way in, and revision allows you to get more and more specific. But I would, you know, dictate these stories, and my teacher was kind of like a secretary, and I was a sort of business executive. Take a letter, Mrs. Kirby, you know. <laughs> and she would write them all down. Later on, um, my mother, Hilma Wallitzer, do any of you know about my mother? Yeah, she published stories starting in the 60s. Her first short story she sold to the old Saturday Evening Post. Do you remember? Write that magazine. And women's magazines in general back then, on one page you could have a picture of a jello mold with pineapple floating in it, and on the facing page you would have a short story by Joyce Carol Oates. It was a golden age of fiction, and it's completely gone. But to give you a sense of my mother's uh, mindset at the time, her first short story was called, Today a Woman Went Mad in the Supermarket. <laughs> and I really think she would have gone mad if she hadn't had the sort of real freedom to write and express herself and become a writer. She was never encouraged by her parents who didn't think girls had to go to college, but she was intuitive. She was an innate writer with a great, great sense of language. But I was very, very lucky that she was very encouraging to me and always read my work and, you know, we talked about it all the time, so much so that years later, I was doing uh, the Q&A after an event, and a woman stood up and said, I have a question for you. My daughter wants to be a writer, a playwright, but I know how hard it is to make it, particularly as a woman, but really for anyone. What should I tell her? And I thought about it, and I said, well, is she good? And she said, yes, very. And I said, is she burning to do this? And she said, yes. And I said, I said, well, I think you should tell her that's wonderful because the world will whittle your daughter down, but a mother never should. And my mother never did, and I think that's really why I'm here today. Um, but then jumping ahead much later than that, I had another mentor. And we didn't call these people mentors, right? You don't know that that's happening at the time necessarily. Um, but uh, an early novel of mine was optioned by the great journalist, humorist, director, screenwriter, novelist, uh, Nora Ephron, if some of you liked her work. And the first film she ever directed was based on my book, and it was called This Is My Life, and it was about a stand-up comic and her two daughters. Julie Kavner was in it. And Nora just basically invited me along for the ride to be part of it. It was all hands on deck, and I was very pregnant with my first son, and I, I was being, you know, very doing everything the right way, and Nora wanted me to come to a comedy club to sort of look at comedians to see if we could put them in the movie. And I was like, no, I have my Lamaze class. <laughs> and she said, I'm going to try to do her voice a little bit. She said, I'll tell you what they were going to teach you. <gasps> <gasps> so <laughs> I went with her. Childbirth was very painful. Um, but when I think about Nora and what I got from her, I mean, the thing was, after she died, so many writers spoke about how she would call them up and say, I read your book, can I take you to lunch? 
And she did this not out of, she just did this because it was what she wanted to do and it was the right thing to do and it meant everything to all of these young writers. It absolutely did. But I also got something else from her. I, I want to sort of talk for just a little brief side trip about humor because we want our writers to have gravitas on the page but then get up there and be, you know, do shtick in some way. But Nora was the first person I knew who really made me understand that humor is a serious business. That when we explore humor, we're exploring the culture, we're exploring character, we're exploring absurdity, we're often exploring death and fear of death. Um, so in The Female Persuasion, there is a little bit about Greer when she's a child. Because she's so shy, she can't ask for what she wants, so she's left with things she doesn't want. And sometimes she's left with a person she doesn't want. So there she is in her fourth grade classroom, sitting next to the weird girl in the classroom eating Pringles. And this is a total aside. It doesn't, you know, it's not about the feminism of the book, but it connects. She's sitting there with the weird girl, and the weird girl says to her, do you ever think about poisoning our teacher? <laughs> and Greer says, no. And the weird girl says, yeah, neither do I. Um, <laughs> and I, <laughs> I was sort of proud of that because I understood that Nora would have gotten it and would have understood why it's there, why it needed to be there. Humor, though, you can't really force it in. Are some of you writers who are trying to write, some of you here? People don't really want to say because they're afraid Oh, you raised your hand last week, Madge. I haven't seen anything of yours in print, you know. I love how I'm doing the universal symbol for holding a, a shopping cart, right? Um, but here's, here's something, um, what humor isn't. Uh, humor is not like Mad Libs, insert joke here, and it's not jokes. For instance, I'll tell you a joke. Um, it was an old woman's hundredth birthday and her entire family gathered around and said, Grandma, you're a hundred years old. Is there something you've always wanted to do all your life and never had a chance to do? And she thought about it and said, well, there is one thing. All my life I've wanted to go whitewater rafting on the Colorado River. And they thought, well, we did ask her, okay. So they arranged a private nurse and they fit, had her head fitted with a little helmet and they had a little IV pole and she was airlifted from the nursing home carried across the country, very gently lowered onto a raft with the nurse and the blood pressure cuff, and it was thrilling. Afterward, she was taken back, and a year went by, and she was still alive. And they said, Grandma, you are now 101 years old. It's just wonderful. Is there anything you've always wanted to do your entire life and never had a chance to do? And she said, well, there is one thing. All my life, I've wanted to go whitewater rafting on the Colorado <laughs> River. <laughs> Thing. If I'm the thing that makes that joke work, the thing that makes that joke work is all the things I put in that then I took away. Like, didn't you sort of like children imagine the little IV and the helmet? Like you're do you we do what people ask us to do when we're in a passive position of listening at a reading or an event. But all of those details were put in to take away. When I write fiction, the details that I put in are not meant to be taken away. They're meant to enrich the story. They're not a trick. They're not like the kind of stories that children write, oh, it was all a dream, you know? I mean, that's the same kind of thing. That doesn't work. We put things in to show who characters are. Um, so in The Female Persuasion, I have this very shy Greer Kadetsky. And it's almost like that children's book, if you give a mouse a cookie, if you have a shy young woman, aren't you perhaps going to want a less shy older one to be in this book? That's the way I thought of it. So the relationship between them really became the center of the book, although there's also, it's a, it's a kind of double, double love story because there's her boyfriend, Corey, and what happens over time, and her best friend. Um, I thought that I would not do a real reading, but read you just like a tiny, tiny drop so you can get a sense of the book. Kind of like an amuse-bouche of a reading, I guess. Um, and I thought to give you a feeling about who the characters are, um, here's a, just a tiny little moment of Greer when she meets Faith in the college chapel and feels her life sort of enlightened by this famous feminist who 
wears really cool boots and um, became really big in 1973. And now here it is, 2006, and she's still out on the lecture circuit. At the podium, Faith said, whenever I give a talk at colleges, I meet young women who say, I'm not a feminist, but, by which they mean, I don't call myself a feminist, but I want equal pay, and I want to have equal relationships with men, and of course I want to have an equal right to sexual pleasure. I want to have a fair and good life. I don't want to be held back because I'm a woman. Later, Greer understood that what Faith had actually said in her speech was only one part of the whole effect. What also mattered was that it was her speaking these words, meaning them, conveying them with such feeling to everyone in the room. And I always want to reply, said Faith, what do you think feminism is other than that? How do you think you're going to get those things if you deny the political movement that is all about obtaining that life that you want? She stopped for a moment, and they all thought about this, some of them surely thinking about themselves. They watched her take a slow and deliberate drink of water, which was somehow, Greer realized, highly interesting. To me, Faith continued, there are two aspects to feminism. The first is individualism, which is that I get to shape my own life. But there's a second aspect, too, and here I want to use that old-fashioned word, sisterhood, which may make you groan and head for the exits in a stampede, but I'll take that chance. There was laughter. They were all listening. They were all with her now, and they wanted her to know it. Sisterhood, she said, is about being together with other women in a cause that allows all women to make the individual choices they want. Because as long as women are separate from one another, organized around competition, like in a children's game where only one person gets to be the princess, then it will be the rare woman who is not in the end narrowed and limited by our society's idea of what a woman should be. She stopped again and looked out over the whole room, sweeping her gaze across them. So the next time you say, I'm not a feminist, remember this. Oh, and here's a final thought. Along the way, as you're fighting for what matters, you will definitely come up against resistance. The truth is that not everyone is going to agree with you. Not everyone is going to like you or love you. That's right, some people are going to hate you, and that is going to be hard to accept. But my feeling is that if you're out there doing what matters, if it's any consolation at all, I love you. She smiled a brief, encouraging smile at them, and that was it. Greer folded. She was taken in forever, taken up, wanting more of this. Faith had made her little joke about loving them, but as Greer listened to Faith, what she herself felt seemed closely related to falling in love. The sensation wasn't sexual, but the word love still seemed relevant here, love which pollinated the air around Faith Frank. Surely other people felt it too, didn't they? And even if they'd been in a teenage stupor for years, staring at themselves in every reflective surface, frowning at their image as they popped a pimple with a little splat of greenish milk against class <laughs> and railing to friends about their dumb parents. Now a revelatory gong had been struck inside them. It vibrated and vibrated. Faith said, okay, well, I think I've just about run out of things to tell you. I'm going to be quiet now and give the rest of you a chance to talk. Thank you so much for listening. The room was eruptive with appreciative clapping, as loud as if an object had been dropped into a pan of hot oil from a great height. Someone in the back called out, Faith, you rock! And someone else shouted, effing awesome boots, which made Faith Frank laugh. Of course, she had a great laugh. The head went back and the mouth opened, the gullet exposed as if she were a sleek and elegant seal about to swallow a fish. So I'll stop with that. Um, so thank you, thank you. Um, but I mean, people ask writers, how do you get your ideas? You know, and the jokey, annoying ones say, I get them in Cleveland or whatever they say. Well, that's really where do you get your ideas? Um, but I've thought a lot about it because I've been writing novels for a long time. I sold my first one when I was a senior in college at Brown, and I was very excited because um, it was like, you know, do you remember copy centers, copy stores, right? Yeah. So my book was short, and I sort of was carrying it with me to Random House, and I got into the elevator in the Random House building, and, you know, in its little box, and a priest got on, and he had his manuscript with him. It was about this tall, <laughs> and it was bound up with really, really thick rope. And he looked at me and he said, do they know you're coming? And I said, yes. And he said, they don't know I'm coming. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think it became sort of a metaphor for fiction today. They know we're coming, but sometimes they're not entirely sure how they feel about it. Because we live 
in a nonfiction world, right? You are all on your computers all the time, trying to see what's happening in the world, trying to sort of soothe your anxiety, trying to be informed. Where does fiction relate to that? Where does fiction fit in? Um, so this novel deals with a famous feminist, but it's about making meaning. It's more generally about the idea of making meaning, which is something I think I've thought about for a very long time. I once did an event at, um, not long ago actually, for this book, The Female Persuasion, at Ann Patchett's wonderful bookstore in Nashville, and she interviewed me on stage, and I said during the Q&A that I thought that all writers had two or three arias to sing, and Ann said one. And that may be true. <laughs> But you kind of have to figure out what are your arias or your aria. I mean, people say to writers, write what you know. I actually think it's write what obsesses you. How do you know what obsesses you? There's one terrible way to know that nobody would want to do. Look at everything you've Googled for the past 24 hours. You will know yourself. It would be horrible, though. For me, it would be a combination of Virginia Woolf and Does This Mole Look Suspicious, which I don't really think would make a good book. But when I look, but when I look back, when I look back at my body of work, um, I see a thread. I definitely see a thread, and um, I wanted to mention my book, *The Wife*, um, which has is a f oh, wow! You didn't clap for the other one. No, just <laughs> um, thank you. Um, so I got the DVD yesterday. So this is my um, this is my uh, show and tell of how it looks, um, and the cover. There's a new movie tie-in that looks this way, too. Because so many people have asked me about my involvement in that, I thought I'd take a minute or two to sort of talk about that. Um, so I wrote the novel The Wife uh, more than 15 years ago. It came out in 2003. You would think it was like the newest thing. But you know, remember that commercial, We Will Serve No Wine Before It's Time? <laughs> this one really didn't get served as a film for a very long time. And what happened in the beginning to kind of tie in all my themes of feminism and fiction, um, there was a wonderful screenwriter who, who was the screenwriter of this, Jane Anderson, and she wanted to do this. And um, there was a, uh, a movie studio attached. But after, they tried to uh, get the movie cast. And back then, they had to get a man to play uh, the part of the husband. That was really going to be important first to getting the movie made. And they could not get an actor who they thought could carry the movie to play the part of a kind of jerk uh, in a movie called The Wife. So it's like a double injury, right? You have to be a jerk, but also sort of get second billing. Um, but Jane stayed with it, and she, along the way, wrote uh, the screenplay of Olive Kitteridge for HBO and won the Emmy, but kept staying with it. And every once in a while, she would write me and say, I fear we've come to the end of the line, my friend, and I was sad. But it kept not dying. And eventually, we got some Scandinavian money, and Jonathan Price and Glenn Close got attached to it, and the rest is herstory. Um, no, um, I feel so lucky to have had this experience. I mean, of course, right now, Glenn is, you know, won the Golden Globe and is, is nominated for the Academy Award, and uh, won the SAG Award and is nominated for the BAFTA. So all these awards that writers like me, like, we don't know from BAFTA. We're like, what? you know, like, I'm, I'm sitting around with my friends eating hummus and, you know, talking about our, our novels. But it's delightful to have this in my life, I have to say. I mean, I'm, I'm kidding a bit, but I really have loved seeing the different way that an actress um, approaches character. For me, character is this sort of strange, sublime thing, and I'm always trying to figure out how to get at it. The great writer Zadie Smith um, said of fiction, when I write, I'm trying to express my way of being in the world. And I think about that so much, because what is a novel? Like, why do you write a novel? These books, The Female Persuasion and The Wife, and a book I wrote called The Interestings, none of them are my story. And why should you, as the reader, want to read about made-up people who existed in my head? I think that there is the kind of Forsterian only connect idea, but there's something in character that is, in, in, did some of you see Glenn's speech at the SAG <laughs> Awards when she talked about being, you know, eyes looking into eyes and she talked about empathy? There was a study done some years ago that people who read fiction have a greater capacity for empathy 
We all knew that, right? We just hadn't had the science to sort of show that. When I'm creating a character, here's how it is. I, you know that feeling when you're at home and you really want to talk to a particular friend and you don't have anything you need to say to that friend but you pick up the phone and talk to them? You know that there's a feeling you'll get and you can't quite put it into words. It's a, it's a change in the room temperature. It's a sort of change in the valence of things. And that's what I try to do with character. And it was so moving to me that what Glenn does is, is like the performative uh, version of that. She doesn't say a line unless she understands where it comes from. And so much came out in her face, whereas my character in The Wife um, is really kind of, she's very angry and she's telling her story. Glenn is very angry and she's telling her story too, but she's withholding it as long as she can. In the book, right on the first page, you get the story. And it, it takes place uh, en route to the Helsinki Prize, which is a made-up prize. As with, It's funny because as with Gloria Steinem and this character of Faith Frank, who's a true invention, but she's described as a few steps down in fame, the Helsinki Prize, the made-up prize, is a few steps down from the Nobel. But when Jane wrote the script, she elevated everything, and that made it more dramatic, and, and people would understand what that would mean if you, in fact, won such a prize. So I feel really honored, and looking at my books, there is definitely a theme running through them. I have been a feminist my whole life. Um, I, when I was, because I saw my mother struggling and be helped by other women when she became a writer without any encouragement from anyone, other women encouraged her. That was absolutely true. And um, I was in a consciousness raising group. Is that a term that people, I feel like when I say that term, it's like I'm talking about doing scrimshaw or <laughs> something so of the past, right? But we wrote away, my friends and I wrote away to the National Organization for Women asking for a list of topics, and they sent us a pamphlet with topics like sexual fulfillment in you. We were 13, 14. <laughs> we really wanted the topics when your mom won't listen or when they make you clean your room. But we got it, I felt it, and I still feel very, very moved and helped by the teachers I've had in my life. The wonderful novelist Mary Gordon, who was an early teacher of mine, um, said to our class, only write about what's important. And there's a parenthetical in there. What she meant was what's important to you, which made us who are in college start thinking, what's important to me? Nobody's ever asked me that before. I mean, what's important to me? I don't know. And I started having to think about that a great deal. Another early teacher um, that same year was the writer John Irving, who was incredibly important to me. And he came to uh, my first reading and said, I loved what you wrote, but I didn't like the way you read it. Because I was reading in this voice. Now, I, I'll, I'll imitate it, but it's so embarrassing. Um, when I wrote The Interestings, uh, which starts, it's about a group, it's about talent over time and what happens to it over time. I had gone to a performing arts summer camp the summer I was 15, which was the summer Richard Nixon resigned. and. I was so terrible in every play, but regardless of what play it was, it could be a Neil Simon play or a Lorca play, The House of Bernarda Alba, I used my one voice, what I can only call my Catherine Hepburn voice. Mother, where are you? Where are you, mother? You know, it was so horrible, horrible. And my writer's version, oh, if, you've, if you've been to poetry readings, do you know that poetry voice? I come into the room, the oranges are on the table, I am a woman who lives in Brooklyn, I mean, you know. Um, I was using my kind of very meek voice. So in that sense, Greer Kudetsky in The Female Persuasion was shy and hot-faced, and I was that way too. And John said, essentially he was saying, read it like you mean it, like you own it, like it is yours. And I think that was sort of transformative for me. <laughs> so I've been very lucky with great teachers. My mother, who's 89, remains a fabulous one. We have a few minutes for questions, so I thought I would, yeah, yeah. Well, she wasn't Faith. She was, she was, Gloria Steinem was a sort of, you know, a template for a kind of sexy, you know, uh, feminist. But I, cr I hope I created a character whole cloth. But you're asking who was Greer? Yeah. And fully invented. Although the name, if you remember Germaine Greer, unconsciously was in, I didn't, I, I realized that, boy, the mind is a strange place. I only realized later that, that probably in the back of my mind I got the name from from Jermaine Greer, who now <laughs> occupies a very different space in feminism. Yes? Remember, you said, remember you said 
Yes, when you read my book. Thank you. Until the end, when he, the husband had the power and he left. Right. I'm wondering why you didn't allow, and then when I saw the movie, I was thinking, well, maybe the movie should have been She Gets to Leave Him. Because you never say that. It was, what was the rationale? Because he, he had the power the whole way through. And for me, for him to leave her, mm -hmm. still retained the power. Yeah, so she was asking about the wife and, and how the husband had the power all the way through. Here's what I think about power. You know, it changes and it shifts, but it kind of goes back and forth like water being poured into cups. I was very struck by a line, I think it's Robert Louis Stevenson, that marriage is a long conversation. And the idea being that this conversation isn't, she's going to do what she can to change it. You know, there's a line in the film that doesn't come from the book when Glenn says, don't paint me as a victim, I'm much more interesting than that. She's getting a lot from this. Although, one of the things, um, we just did a, uh, Jane and I and Annie Stark, who is Glenn's daughter, who plays young, young uh, Joan Castleman in the film, did an event the other day, a press event, and we were talking about um, the ways in which when you get married, you, there's almost like an invisible contract that is signed between two people. You may not even know that you're signing it. You may sign it in your sleep. But I think that that changed for her over time. And the power, she needs to try to get it any way she can. I, I think it would have felt false if suddenly it all, I, I just had to go by what felt right. And you often, you know, there's a great line, a, a title by the great writer uh, Grace Paley, enormous changes at the last minute. You have to be open to that as a writer. You may not know how your book is going to end, but you have to be open. I wasn't sure how the book was going to end. In my book, The Interestings, one of the characters dies, um, and I believe me, I heard from people online. Although, you know, if you're a writer and people have a way to get in touch with you, they really will. I mean, if you're a writer and you write a novel called The Interestings, on Amazon, people are going to headline their review, not very. Um, <laughs> of course, these are the same people. These are the same people who write, this book arrived ripped one star, you know, so I can't really, I can't do anything about it. But I think it's about being open to what feels right, even if people are mad at you. Greer, as a character, is annoying along the way. You have to allow uh, your characters to, you know, annoy you and to annoy the readers because it's in the service of, not a polemic, I never want to write a political polemic or a polemic of any kind. It's in the service of, what might have happened with these people? And this is how I saw it. So, yeah. Um, in the female persuasion, uh, the dreamer versus the doer, more radical, you, you do delineate some of the issues of feminism today being old style, yeah. white middle class. What, can you tell me your thinking behind sure. that? Sure, yeah, so faith is a cute, faith, now in the year, uh, you know, 2003 and excuse, 2006 and then 2010, really more to the point when Greer graduates from college, is now accused by younger feminists of being, um, you know, uh, classist, elitist, uh, like white feminism. And there's a hashtag that I, again, enjoyed. My son would know I would enjoy it. Um, finger sandwich feminism. She's accused, accused of that. Uh, I made up that term. I think that, you know, the thing about feminists and generations of feminists um, is that it's true that there are clashes of ways and feminism needed to become more inclusive to speak to a lot of people and has, you know, been trying to do that. But uh, I think feminists want the same things overall. They want equality. And it's amazing to, I think, most of us that the conversations that people were having in the early 70s or the 60s, we're still having them now, right? But there we are. <laughs> um, but I think it's a legitimate thing to, I had to write about the, the different generations. I mean, with the interestings and with the wife, the characters are the same age. There's a husband and wife in the wife. They're pretty much the same age. Well, he's a little older. He was her professor at Smith in the 50s. That was a fun part to write. Um, and in the interestings, everybody was my age because it's easy because I don't do math. So you know how old people were when Bewitched was on TV, no. Um, but uh, yeah, I, 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 it was interesting to explore, but again, not polemically, because people go to fiction. What do we go to fiction for? I think we go to fiction to find out not what the world is like, but what it might be like. 
you know, what it might be like. And, and I think it does create a sort of empathy, but I also think it allows us to go into this strange dream place that includes ourselves, like sort of almost like in a video game. You're in it, but you're not in it. And uh, there's great beauty in that to me. So writing about politics is not like a separate thing, that, like as with humor, that I would have to kind of insert my politics here. I don't really ever want to take a side. My goal, my mantra is what is it like? What is it like yeah. again and again? What is it like being married to this man who is you know, a real narcissist? And I think Jonathan Price just does such a great job. And in the book, though, he's kind of even worse. I mean, he's described as getting his, uh, um, you know, getting, he, sort of taking his aesthetic from the Dylan Thomas Handbook of Hygiene and Etiquette. You know, he's, he gets away with things the way men have done. So, uh, yeah. It is so exciting um, to have a film made that, that you love. You know, when you write a book, I, I don't know about you in terms of when you read, I'd be curious to know, but I never fully see my character's actual facial features. I see them kind of blurry, like the way people on a reality show who don't want their faces shown look. Um, <laughs> they're kind of blurry, but I know who they are. I know them very, very deeply. As soon as Glenn and Jonathan were cast, the sort of blur, was sharpened into focus, like a, a lens had been had been sharpened. But they are such fine actors, I was thrilled. I mean, I knew that they would go very deeply into the character. So I was honored. I mean, I was absolutely thrilled. And the first time that the film uh, got shown anywhere, it was at the Toronto International Film Festival in 2017. And they held the film back because it would have been too fast to put it out then. But I went and we all, you know, I was sitting in the row with Glenn and she got it, it, a 2000, like 2,000 people in this concert hall stood up. It was a standing ovation. It was right in the midst of everything. Oh, and there's this, do you know that line in the film when she says something like, your wife just won the Nobel Prize? Somebody went, yeah! You know, there was like this tension. It was right, it was like right after Harvey Weinstein. It was like there's this crazy moment. Um, but I don't think it's about, you know, fiction and film aren't disposable. They're not just meant to sort of say, what was it like at that particular moment? I think the film speaks to long-term things that we'll be thinking about for a very, very long time. Um, and it was, it was a beautiful experience for me, really great. I mean, I think that you have to let go of your book if you sell it to Hollywood. People asked me when Nora's film was first being made, um, you know, aren't you afraid of what they're going to do to your book? And I said, well, my book is on the shelf. You know, it, nothing can change it. Nothing can change that. Um, so it's very exciting. It's like the icing on the cake when it happens, but it's never easy. Um, uh, Nicole Kidman is uh, involved with the female persuasion now, um, uh, you know, has, has uh, to produce it, and we'll see what happens with that. And, and I think her work has been amazing. So actors, I, I'm fascinated by actors because all my friends are writers, a couple of actors, but mostly writers. And to see how character and emotion is approached, I feel like novels are like advent calendars. There are a lot of doors in. What is the door that you take? And I think that's true for actors. Um, different doors can be entered to understand a character with great depth. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Oh, if it had been at the time. No. Uh, yeah. How long it took to get the movie made? No. No. Glenn wouldn't. They wouldn't have been the right age. I would have been a whole different, like a parallel film. I don't know. I can't. I don't even want to. Don't make me think about that. What if this is a dream? What if Glenn Close isn't in my movie? And the Academy Award is just a grandiose fantasy, like, in the distance. <laughs> what a yeah. Uh, yes? Um, I am I'm starting to write a new novel, but I also have a children's book coming out. I'm actually going on tour for it called Two Night Owl from Dogfish, coming out in a couple of weeks, and it's sort of a gay parent trap. Two, two men, two single gay fathers fall in love and want their daughters 
to be friends and send them to camp together and di they dislike each other. It's all in letters. Um, I wrote it with a friend of mine and it was, you know, my feeling about different forms and different, it's coming out February 12th. My, uh, my feeling about different forms of writing is that you are you. I mean, it's not like you take off one hat, well, you do take it off, but you, the head is still the same head underneath it. So I just sort of love to write. I feel incredibly lucky that I get to live and work as a writer. It's the best thing, because I've wanted to do it since I was writing those terrible stories about the rig, Mac. <laughs> yeah. Um, anybody else? Yeah. Uh, well, actually, let me ask somebody else. I am writing the screenplay, my, my co-writer and I, to the, the kids' book, and I have done some screen stuff, nothing that's been produced, but not in a big way. I think I'm much more of a natural fiction writer. That's what I really love to do. Because I love the side trips that you can take in fiction, right? You know how, well, look like Anna Karenina, suddenly you have the agrarian side trip. I mean, in a script, uh, it's really about stay, I, I love to go into the dishwasher scene and then suddenly you're back in the Crimean War, and then you're, you know, you can't do that in a film in the same way. Um, so that's what I love to do. Uh, yeah. Can you speak a little bit about your process? I mean, you, in, in, in all of your novels, you create these richly vivid characters and everything is set up and it's supposed to be the best. And for instance, the Beatles in Sweden, how long did it take you to write? What is your daily routine like? How sure. fleshing out your ideas? It took me, um, it, it took me uh, like two, two and a half years to write maybe something in there. Uh, and I try to write every day when I'm at home, but I travel a lot, so it becomes difficult to do. But it, if I'm thinking about my work, I decide that counts. It's sort of like a, a rationale of some sort. It sounds like a, the parallel to sort of dieting rationales, you know. Um, but I, I think it's true. I think that if a writer is connected to her work, um, sort of doesn't go too far from it. You're always working things out in some way. I live in New York City. I'm married to a writer. He's a nonfiction writer. I have two grown sons. I get up in the morning and try to use the earliest hours of the day because it's diminishing returns, kind of blood sugar diminishing returns by the time the day ends. I play Scrabble online and that's the worst. Um, <laughs> also, if you check your email in the middle of, or check, uh, go online in the middle of writing a lyrical passage, you know, you stop, you're working on this paragraph, you're very proud of the imagery. You go look online, you're on Yahoo, it says top 10 resorts. And you're like, you're not even planning on going anywhere. You're like, Aruba, oh yeah, I went to Aruba. And now you go back and suddenly Aruba appears in your novel. You know, it's a terrible, it's a terrible distraction. It is very, very hard to try to stay focused in this world of major distractions. But um, the best way that I know how to do that is to read something uh, by a writer you love, where you feel the writer was excited when he or she was writing the book. So I, I'm always reading. I, I read read good things. You know that's the best way. Read wonderful writers and uh, try to. You know I don't m worry about being derivative because if you're a derivative of someone wonderful, so be it. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Opposite. Yeah. And that's part of your script. Yeah. Exactly what I want to oh, good. Well, yeah. put on a sandwich board, walk around wherever you live. <laughs> I won't try to stop you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, I think uh, we have to stop before my mic shuts off. But thank you so much for coming here today. I appreciate it. Thank you.